I'm absolutely blown away. Um, right. I'm, I'm blown away by the resilience of patients. I'm blown away by their endless um, kind of fight and positivity. So I feel a total fraud standing here talking about psychological challenges in ACHD. One thing I'd like to say is <clears throat> as medics and as ACHD consultants or as congenital consultants, we absolutely listen to everything you tell us and you, you, you tell us that's not right to try and make things better. Just to let you know that we listen to how you feel in those gowns, such that in Liverpool we have a fairly bespoke um, gown that people have. It's not a gown, it's a set of PJs with little poppers that open. So if you have your pacemaker, we just open this little bit. I've learned only this morning that there's such a group called the PJ Angels or Fairies. Pajama fairies that, that make bespoke pajamas for kiddies going in with operations with little poppers and things. Also, um, a bit of a plug for our new psychologist, Rachel, who actually most helped me write this massively, but she's starting to do clinics alongside our medical ACHD clinics in Liverpool. Um, you know, for lots of reasons, she's actively wanting to research the psychological impacts of how people feel. And I'm sure if she hasn't already made contact with Amy, she will in terms of looking at the Heart Hub app, because I think that's absolutely awesome. So, as I say, I feel a fraud, but I'm going to touch a little bit on the psychological challenges in ACHD. I'm massively thankful um, to Lisa because she set up you know, a, a good backdrop um, for this. So the psychological needs are important in ACHD to, um, in terms of wider health. And there's a model called the biopsychosocial model, and I will talk a little bit about that. That basically shows how you do not exist in isolation, that your brain doesn't exist in isolation and you and the world can interact. It's a very complicated interaction. I think the thing that I appreciate as a, as a doctor is what individuals perceive and interpret their health situation to be appears to be more related to their psychological outcomes than the actual health condition. So, if you have got what we would class as a minor congenital heart disease, that doesn't relay into a minor psychological impact. And so it's not necessarily true that if you've had the most difficult journey, that you're going to have the most difficult psychological situation. Psychological difficulties are very, very common. And I think we ought to be embarrassed in the UK that we don't provide as much psychological support. And addressing the psychological needs of individuals with congenital heart disease is recognised as important. You know, thank God in our standards, in our national standards, you know, a psychologist <coughs> is an essential criteria, but only one health time equivalent in a level one or level two unit, not enough. Resilience is recognised as an important positive factor and we've heard about that and we've, I think, actually seen uh, resilience in action with regards to Amy. Uh, I can <coughs> not think of one of the more resilient individuals that I know um, and this can help individuals adjust and uh, adapt well to change and I think some of the um, things this afternoon is going to be touching on resilience. Psychological support and therapies can be useful in, and in improving psychological well-being and resilience for, for individuals. And so even though it may seem, seem bleak, actually <coughs> there are things out there. One therapy doesn't benefit all. Um, and so, you know, the most important thing is to ask and to address these things. 
I think it's important just to ask the question, what is health? In, in the Western world, we put a lot of um, identity on the physical state and that that is what health is or ill health. I will touch a bit on the psychosocial needs and its relationship to health and how that impacts the psychological needs, particularly of patients with individual and, you know, carry on from where Lisa um, stopped. The psychological resilience in ACHD and a little bit on the psychological intervention. So what might you be offered, although I'm not a psychologist at all. Um, and importantly, information on other resources and where to go. So, health is described by the World Health Organization as a positive concept emphasizing social, personal resources, and physical capabilities. And one thing we do in clinic is we concentrate too much on the last one, the physical and we don't concentrate on the other two so much. And I think that's something you know, we need to address. There is a model called the biopsychosocial model. So it brings together all of those elements. And it outlines how the biological, how your body, how the psychology, and how your greater social world interacts and influences your health. So for, as a cardiologist, I think in me only looking at the physical aspect, I'm doing you a disfavour. Um, I need to involve other people that can be improving your personal and social well-being too. What is massively important is the behaviours, thoughts and feelings can influence the physical state. We are all constantly interpreting and appraising ourselves and comparing ourselves and it changes over time and every single day is different every single event that happens to you or any of us impacts how you're interpreting and appraising yourself um, and that includes your health and bodily symptoms our own thoughts our attitudes our beliefs can influence our health behaviours. And so one thing I really think that we don't get taught well um, as doctors is how those things can impact the physical. And particularly, we, we live in a multicultural, um, you know, a multi-societal environment. And I think we're quite, I can't think of the right word, I think we're quite arrogant in the West at not appreciating um, the impact of, of those different elements to health and people accessing health, and particularly with mental health. There are groups of our society where mental health is not talked about, um, and it's for us to kind of try and push those boundaries, if you like. So this is the little model that I was talking about, how your body, your psychology, and the social environment can impact your health at the centre there. So everything has an impact and an influence. So in terms of your biology, you can't change a lot of this. You can't change your gender, your physical illness sometimes, disability, and there is work on genetic vulnerability also in, in mental health, immune function, neurochemistry. So adverse psychological effects can actually change the brain chemistry and so it's important that we understand that and the role of medication and treatments stress reactivity and importantly medication we use a hell of a lot of beta blockers beta blockers cause depression or can cause depression some medications can worsen your symptoms and raise your anxiety so as a medic we need to be aware of that some things we can change, though. We can change or have an influence on psychology and the social context. So we can help in terms of learning and memory and the impacts of people in childhood and growing and within hospital. We can, to a certain degree, have an impact on attitudes and beliefs. And I think Amy has articulated how she has 
worked with that over time. Um, we can have an impact on our personality um, in what are positive and negative traits, and we absolutely can impact our behaviours, particularly to health. Okay, so cognitive behavioural therapy um, may uh, come into that. Emotions, again, we can influence. Coping skills, um, we can teach and train and mentor and past traumas. We can't change the past traumas we've all been through in life, whether it's medical or otherwise, but our response to it, we can. And it's us as congenital, um, you know, team, it's for us there to guide you and to provide you with that support or to signpost you to it. In terms of the social context, having the social supports and understanding the impact of family and friends and cultures and, you know, the social situation, your education and how all of that feeds in. You can see how this is a, a massively complex situation. So just coming to clinic in the middle of all of this, I think is woefully inadequate. There's lots of models in psychology and at first I was a bit overwhelmed by this when it was shared with our psychologist, but it just shows if you see in the middle <coughs> the individual and all of those direct things such as their sex, their age, their health, but the massive effects the rest of the environment has and so human development shows how the self is influenced by lots of external social factors that may be beyond your control. So actually, the only thing you can control is yourself and your response to these things. Okay. So just think, how might a diagnosis or living with congenital heart disease, which is an ever-changing situation and landscape, influence or be influenced by these systems. It's enormous. So, the psychological needs for patients with ACHD or congenital heart disease. Patients' own subjective health status, so how they perceive or interpret their health is strongly associated with their psychological and social outcomes, more so than their actual physical illness, and that's massively important. Approximately one-third of adult congenital heart disease patients are reported to meet the criteria for a mood or anxiety disorder. And so, as Lisa said, the, the requirements and the need for psychological support, training, education is huge. When patients were asked what they most wanted support for, the most frequently reported areas were stress management and coping with their heart disease and the, the wider effects. So hopefully in some of the breakout sessions this afternoon we'll start to address and thank you to the Somerville Foundation for listening to that and that opportunity. So depression is also commonly cited in the general cardiology literature as being a common experience. However, at adults with congenital heart disease can also be at risk of elevated anxiety and in particular post-traumatic stress disorder as Lisa went into in, in more detail. And I think we need to recognise that. We are still traumatising patients coming into our hospital. So a lot of people remember the trauma of childhood, but actually we're still doing it now. We know about this, so we need to stop it, okay? And we need to stop it now. So you are all resilient. You are all warriors. You are all survivors. You are the reason I get up in the morning, okay? You are the reason why ACHD exists, and so you are resilient. And resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. I wouldn't say quickly. I don't think you need to put a time scale on it. It's also classed as toughness. 
or an ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. You were all of that. So from being that blue baby and being given back as a pink baby and then being out here now, believe it, you are all resilient. So ca characteristics of personal resilience are strong self-esteem, having an action-oriented approach, so making plans, as Amy said, she's a planner. Having personal goals, and it doesn't matter what those goals are, if it's walking for 10 minutes in the park, or is it running a marathon, it's about the goal. Being able to use humour, and as anybody knows who comes to any of my clinics, um, there's a lot of humour. And having patience. Being able to uh, adapt successfully to change, and we all need to do that, and sometimes that's something we can have help with. Having strong relationships and being able to ask for help when we need it, and that's really difficult for some reason, particularly in, again, the Western world, we don't ask. We don't put our hands up and say, I'm struggling. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength, putting your hand up. Having that internal <coughs> locus of control, saying, I am in control. Everything out there is chaos and mad, and I have no control over it, but in here, I have control. And this means you perceive that you have some control out of those uncontrollables, as opposed to feeling out of control and things being done to you. I love this picture. I apply it to my life. A smooth sea is never a smooth sea never makes a skilled tailor, a sailor. A tailor sailor, yeah. Um, it means that we grow throughout life. It's you know, um, adversity makes us stronger, I guess. Research highlights that resilience of individuals with ACHD, including several themes of resilience, such as feeling proud and mature, proud that you've survived. Being able to focus on the possibilities. So when I ruined Amy's Christmas by telling her she couldn't, wasn't going to be going on holiday, she did go on holiday. She did go off to do other things. So focusing on the possibilities, rather what you can't do, managing physical restrictions and medical procedures, and having a commitment to life. So living with the uncertainty and making the most out of life, which every one of you do. So what are some of the psychological reactions to challenges of living with ACHD? Some of us may be more resilient than others and may be less prone to worry, anxiety or low mood. And that might be a genetic thing. There's lots of factors that influence that. Sometimes in life, circumstances may occur that mean further psychological support is needed to help you with that resilience. But not every depression, anxiety is pathological. Okay? Low mood can be understandable reaction to an acute change. Um, and so that doesn't mean to say that that needs to become a big issue. We might just need support. Okay, death of a loved one, you're going to feel low. Okay, it's understandable and normal to experience psychological reactions. Okay, and again, we don't celebrate this uh, in, in the Western world particularly. The presence of low mood or anxiety over a longer period of time or high levels of distress <coughs> that become debilitating, impacting on your quality of life, may indicate that you require further support. So what kind of psychological therapies are there? There is a huge variety, and that's why it's super important that psychologists are an essential part of our team because that's their trade and they will be able in assessing somebody, direct them to the most appropriate form of therapy, or indeed if they need that therapy. One of the most commonly used is cognitive behavioural therapy. It's recommended by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence for psychological difficulties, particularly anxiety and depression most commonly. 
The great thing about CBT is it addresses your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to something, recognizing that some things are out of your control, but actually you have that control within you. It's a useful tool when there are high levels of avoidance. There's lots of people I come across who are absolutely terrified of needles. They may be tattooed, and that's another thing, but they're <laughs> terrified of needles. And our heart surgeons are forever saying, how come they can be terrified of needles? They're covered on top to toe with a tattoo. Basic lack of understanding. Anxiety and or low mood is pronounced, or there's a high level of distressing and particularly intrusive thoughts such as post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's this thing called a CBT cycle, um, where you address the situation, um, explore the thoughts, the thoughts will lead to moods and feelings, you look at your behaviour and your physical reaction and then that feeds back thoughts and you get into a big cycle. So if we look at a, a common behaviour that's addressed in CBT is avoidance. So let's say avoidance of having a blood test, because it's fairly common. Avoiding a situation, so me saying, so do you fancy us doing your Fontan bloods today? No, I'll get it done at my GP's next week to feel more comfy there. Um, or experiences, because anxiety is short-term and long-term consequences. The more we avoid that, because I know some of you are not going to go to your GP. I know, I know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and I understand it and, you know, we'll provide support to go. Um, but the more you avoid the situation, the more the anxiety builds because it entrains in you, I, the needle's going to be awful. Um, and then the anxiety can become more generalised. So then the next time you come to clinic, because you know I'm going to ask about bloods, you're anxious before you come into clinic, you've been up all night and you're tired and you've set your palpitations off. Um, or, you know, you don't come to clinic. You know, you can see how it can become a bigger issue. And so the more avoidance in more and more situations, and then because you've got your palpitations and you're starting to get anxious and you're starting to get panic attacks, you withdraw from going out with your friends, you start not going to work because you're starting to get palpitations in the morning, you can see how it kind of builds and builds. Avoidance can mean we miss out on those valued and important aspects of our life that are actually preventative in poor mental health. So CBT techniques for this avoidance can use a graded exposure. And this is similar, similar to when we have patients who are absolutely terrified of having a catheter or absolutely terrified because they need further surgery and we've explained to them that they need further surgery, we may do a goal kind of orientated um, approach where on the left hand side, this is a patient in clinic who needs to have a cardiac catheter and it just, it's just too overwhelming. Um, and so what we do is there are little steps along the way where, you know, we may talk about having a catheter. We may take them for a walk around the hospital. They may then go and visit the catheter lab. Lots of little steps, almost not desensitizing, but removing the anxiety about it to get to that point. So each step is repeated until the anxiety reduces to a manageable level and then we can progress to the next stage of the process. Again, cardiac MRI scans are another thing that fill people with anxiety and dread. So small steps over time can make big changes. So the important thing, a way of improving low mood and reducing anxiety and overall quality of life is having smart goals in life, okay? So your goal should be specific, should be measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed. And we can apply that to anything. So specific, I want to walk in the park for 30 minutes. Measurable, I want to be able to do this four times a week. And achievable, making sure the goal is doable. So 
it may be that you know setting a goal of running a marathon at the moment is too much and you then will feel negative because you've not achieved it but actually if you start off small and build up over time you can achieve it and that gives you such a positive self-worth back so we'll move off from CBT and a bit to mindfulness and again I know that you're going to be doing this in your breakout sessions so this is another thing is you can't stop the waves okay in life but you can learn to surf them all right and I think that's massively important mindfulness is a method of mental training it's a skill that can be built it takes practice so actually, I think of mindfulness is exercise for your mind, but it's a lot easier exercise than physical exercise because you can sit there with a book, you could sit doing some artwork, you can be in the garden, which I do for my mindfulness, or walking the dogs. It's also recognised as a treatment for the National Institute of Clinical Ex Excellence for persistent and low mood. We know that reg regular mindfulness practice has been shown to increase subjective <coughs> well-being and hope, reduce anxiety and depression, lead to a decline in your perceived stress. And remember, I said it's about what you perceive is important. It also has a physical reaction, lead to a reduction in blood pressure and stress reactivity. When we measure stress hormones, they're reduced <coughs> during periods of mindfulness. So I think this caption is really good and, and Rachel, our psychologist, obviously in the short time she's been with us, knows me very well because it's me and, well, one dog, I've got two, but she clearly knew this picture. So is it that you have a mindful or have you a mindful? So often in life and with all of these things happening, on the left-hand side you have a mindful of so many thoughts and worries that this person is not able to fully appreciate the present moment, so can't see the lovely trees, you know, what's going on with their doggies. Whereas mindful and fully aware of the present and surrounding envi environment allows you not to be over-occupied by these thoughts. So mindfulness can help us take a more objective view of our thoughts and feelings, emotions. So I've gone back to my first slide in summary, the psychological needs of patients with ACHD in terms of the wider health is massively important and we need to push government for further support of this and our local trusts, they need to put their money where their mouth is. What individuals perceive and interpret their health status to be appears to be more related to their psychological outcomes than their actual observed health status. Just remember guys, psychological difficulties is common not only within ACHD, actually in the whole world, okay, and we should get rid of the stigma and addressing the psychosocial needs of individuals with ACHD is just as important as you come into clinic via physical tests and your echo and everything else. Resilience is recognised as an important positive factor and this can help individuals adjust and adapt well to change things we can't do anything about. Psychological support and therapies can be useful and in some situations, you know, life-saving in improving psychological well-being and resilience for individuals with OCHD. So further resources. In addition to using below avenues of support, don't forget your GP. C tell your ACHD team, okay? We can absolutely help. There's a lot of our consultants and nurses across the UK have done advanced kind of communication skills and psychological training. Talk, open up to friends, family, peers, whether it's on social network, just open up. Look to your support groups, whether it's a Somerville or your local support group. And there's a number of useful um, resources such as these. So um, resources for CBT, mindfulness, um, obviously Mind UK's mental health charity 
and there's other things like Headspace Calm and Insight, which are apps um, to use on your um, smartphones. Thank you. Thank you.